Hello and welcome to Campaign Preview 2. This is your second look at the later stages of the single player campaign for Stronghold Warlords. Today I've got with me, not the man pictured in the video there, but I've got with me Tony, uh, lead programmer at Firefly. Tony, do you want to say hello and tell us a few things about the stuff that you do at Firefly? Hi, um, I am looking more like Genghis today. Um, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> Uh, my name is Tony DeLibro. I'm the lead programmer on Stronghold Warlords and a senior programmer at Firefly Studios. Um, worked on a bunch of our titles, been here for better part of a decade and a half almost. So it's been a long ride. It's all right, Tony. You're in good um, company. I realized the other day that I've, I've been here for uh, nine years. <laughs> yeah, that's about right. I think since the start of my internship. So we're, we're veterans at this point, I think. Yeah, that's like uh, ancient ages in uh, game programmer and uh, developer terms. <laughs> cool. So um, as you can see here, we've got uh, some of the yurts, which are the hovel variants for the Mongolian portion of the single player campaign. Um, we've also got Genghis's um, Keep, which is a new addition. Most, most recent addition, I think, in the last couple of weeks, maybe? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's cool to see... Um, a variety of different keeps in the game because obviously like as a small 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 company we can't we can't do like completely different walls completely different buildings you know for each of the of the four nations that we're representing but i think the keeps quite a nice little touch yeah it kind of sets the stage for what your uh faction is like what area you're in and um uh i don't know relates a little more to um uh, the geographic area yes. as opposed to um, just kind of always looking the same. So it kind of grounds that at least, even though we're, we're definitely going for the smorgasbord of um, uh, cultural blending with all yes. the uh, various uh, troop types that you might have in a given army. Yeah, we're kind of doing as much as we can do in terms of, you know, making each location feel unique in terms of like, I guess, like ground textures, uh, a few buildings, not like most of them are going to be pretty uniform for, uh, you know, the four different um, portions of the campaign. But there are a few things that we can do to make you believe that you're, you know, in 300 BC or, you know, 1600 AD or however far forward we're going. Um, but the keep's definitely a nice thing to sort of touch on. Yeah, I think the um, the terrain in general too, the, the flavor of the open plains here versus the jungly areas is pretty different. Yeah. Also sets the scene for this game i'm working on a number of things you uh, basically responsible for the core um, code systems and just making sure all the code works together um, we have a couple of other people working on code uh, matt who i believe has uh is well known to people who watch these streams at this point yep. and uh steven our our designer is doing a ton of the code as well this time and um we have help from jack also he's come over from metamorph so we have um uh, four of us in total touching the code at the moment. And so I'm coordinating that um, with um, everybody and just making sure it all glues together. And uh, I've been focused mostly on the core tech stuff. So um, making the physics stuff and the, um, uh, the network code work and the game systems and uh, efficiency and all that stuff. Um, it's my main focus, but um, personally, I've done a lot of gameplay coding. So a lot of the units and a lot of the um, uh, economic systems. Um, I do the UI and the animation and the coding for the for that. And um, uh, lots and lots of polish work lately. Yes. Well, it's not a million miles away from, you know, you hear like um, stories of, of one developer teams. Um, and if you read up on it, they actually worked with a bunch of, you know, outsourced artists and all that kind of stuff. So it's not entirely different to that. Like you're responsible for quite a lot of the kind of core game. Oh yeah, each of us um, has quite a bit of a load compared to um, a company that had, say, more than four coders working on an entire RTS. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I mean, uh, well, you know, Jack is helping out. He's um, he's doing. Um, uh, like really specific systems now, but for yep. most of the development time, it was just um, uh, Matt, myself, and uh, Steven writing yep. all the code. And um, of course, we were building on our prior work, but um, I think uh, in terms of specialty, you know, we have one graphics guy, really. Matt is our main shader programmer. I can touch the stuff, but I barely uh, can do what he can manage. Yeah. Um, and uh, Steven has taken on uh, big swaths of things like 
polishing the formations code to be more interesting than we had in the yeah. past and uh, um, working on gameplay systems in general. But yeah, I mean, uh, usually one of these systems like a, a farm system or um, an industry system or a military uh, unit or a trap or something like that ends up being a very tight collaboration between just Andreas uh, mm -hmm. and um, one of us coders to make the whole thing happen, including uh, basic implementation and polish and all. Yeah. I mean, I'll never forget, um, I think it was, I can't remember what show it was, maybe PAX or GDC or something like that, but I was talking to um, someone who worked in AAA about RTSs, and he was like, oh yeah, I can't imagine doing an RTS with less than 50 staff. <laughs> and I was like, well, let me talk to you, my friend, about the Firefly way. <laughs> um, yeah, every time I watch um, a, uh, an epic scene from something like a Total War game, and uh, you just see the production values they can put in there because they have huge, talented staffs, right? Yeah. <laughs> It, it blows my mind. I'm like, okay, you know, so we, we look at it from a, okay, we're a little scrappier than that. What can we right. pull off? Yeah, I, I think if you talk to any of them and you said that we had it. essentially like two and a half coders, they'd just have a heart attack and just drop <laughs> dead straight there on the spot. Yep. So one of the earliest yeah, so things you did, which we can see here, is the uh, wall system. Reworked yes. with Crusader 2. Do you want to talk a little bit about the kind of improvements we've got there? Stuff like it hugging the terrain and... Um, all the kind of little, new little features we've got. Yeah, glad to. So um, early on, um, just during development, you know, we had a lot of um, uh, carryover wishes from Crusader 2. And um, one of our first things to do with a number of these things is to experiment and see what we can improve, you know, to get more towards what we want versus mm. how things work. So um, a big part of that was the walls. And in Crusader 2, the walls had gone uh, from being freeform placement to adhering to a grid again, as they had in old titles just for gameplay's sake really because it's uh, much easier to build especially you know something as complex as walls without yep. having to fiddle about lining them up precisely with towers you know if you have a grid system it's much easier um so that whole wall system was pr pretty complex and it, it worked um but it couldn't do things like uh slope terrain too well and it couldn't do things like um uh, connections between um buildings and towers quite the way we liked yeah so um this time around we kind of looked back and we're like man you know what can we do to make the walls better and thinner as well because the um the actual thickness of a strong wall in crusader 2 was rather large in terms of tiles it was at least two tiles wide and it had a quarter tile on either side for the crenellations right so this time around we're like okay we kind of want a single tile to be a full up wall with crenellation so that the, the castles don't have to be thick to be effective, right? They, they look a little more accurate, you know, when they're thinner like this because that's how real walls are. Mm. And if you want to build big, thick extension, extensive walls, then you can do it. Um, so basically, we looked back and we said, you know what? Uh, Legends actually did that quite well. It had single tile width walls that. Um, had the crenellation built in and um, were walkable, you know, and um, mm. had a good interconnection scheme. So um, I went back to the drawing board with that and studied it and um, reconfigured um, our wall system uh, from Crusader 2's standpoint to work more like Legends. And a big part of that too was following terrain because we thought, okay, we're making a, uh, a game. It's going to be set in a generic Asia, but if we can't have walls rolling over hills, like in all the reference art we've been looking at, um, people are going to be rather disappointed. You know, if you can't create something that looks like the Great Wall of China and yeah. just hugs the terrain and looks like it belongs in the It's landscape. pretty much the only reason why we're adding Steam Workshop support, yeah. right? We need we need to see that, that map realized. <laughs> exactly. So, um, yeah, we thought, okay, well, this is well worth... Um, focusing on from a gameplay perspective anyway, but um, certainly we, we'd be uh, remiss to not actually do it for this game in particular. So um, yeah, we um, uh, I had a lot of time early on to experiment around and that was one of the things I um, uh, was able to get some time for. And um, we liked how it was going, so we carried on and that's why we have this wall system that uh, astute fans of the series will recognize it's very similar to the legend system in a lot of ways yeah and also just for new fans as well like the wall system just being super super duper easy to use and like you know we often use the word paint when you're talking about painting walls and you know laying them out but you really do want it to be just like a brush stroke and it's done kind of thing you don't want to be fiddling with connections and you know all these kind of like glitchy issues that um, you're basically inviting by creating a really complex wall system for a game. <laughs> yeah, well, we still have a very uh, um, 
uh, in-depth well system uh, for this kind of game yeah. compared to many. Yeah. Um, and a big part of that is um, the interconnections with all the towers and how the, they all come together, yeah. um, how stairs work and how you have a wall surface. Like when troops are up on the wall there, um, they get a range bonus yeah. due to their altitude. Yeah. Uh, archers shoot further. They um, are defended. There's a, um, a percentage of the arrows that uh, would hit the troops instead. Yep. Deflect off the walls, for example. Yep. So I think earlier on this video we saw the um, the fire arrow cart hitting the tower and bouncing off. That looks really cool. Oh yeah, yeah. Really pleased with that. Uh, one thing uh, we saw a second ago as well was um, another callback to Legends: the auto buy and auto sell at the market. Yeah, um, people will be very also... happy to see that. I've uh, I've heard that was a fan favorite. Um, it's funny because in the company, some people um, like QA, especially the people who play the game nonstop, love it because it's uh, yeah. you know it's a bit of auto management. They can just <laughs> yeah. let it let it raise revenue for them. Uh, whereas um, some people who play more just like in the moment, mm -hmm. like don't even know it's there. Like <laughs> they, yeah. don't, they don't even think to use it. It's yeah, really funny to me. But um, I, I think it's one of those things that if you want it. It's there, and it uh, it should be very intuitive and do exactly what you want. That's yeah. uh, what we're shooting for. We want it to kind of be obvious when it's on and um, let it do your um, your goods, um, selling for profit or yeah. keeping your wood stocks up or whatever you need to do. I think you definitely get that in RTS. You get people who love the micromanagement side of it <laughs> and others who kind of want certain aspects to be automated for them. Oh yeah, absolutely. It depends on what part of the game you're playing too. I think in a um, in a small scale, you know, skirmish, you might be able to just kind of run everything. And yeah. certainly early on in the game, you, you might not want things auto buying on you. But by the late game, when you know you're just raising a certain crop for uh, profit instead of to use it, you know, or you just want to make sure you never run out of stone and you, you just set a little auto buy on that. Then it starts to make a lot of sense to have an assistant, you know, yeah. help you uh, uh, take care of things like that for you. And of course, alternately, you know, with our um, uh, multiplayer mode, you can join two people into the same estate if you want, like what you've mentioned in the past. Yes, yes, you can. You could have, uh, you could have an actual person doing your auto buying and selling if you don't like the market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this this map's quite interesting because it's obviously starting with you surrounded by hostile warlords. So it's a good thing QA are playing this because they know exactly, you know, how to go about that. You you take them by force so you don't waste your diplomacy points um, and then you save all of those for you know upgrading, requesting supplies, all that kind of stuff. Um, and obviously we are going to have a slightly different system for the Warlords in the final game um, in terms of the influence system. So in previous demos and shows we've just had this system where you get enough diplomacy, you, know, you buy the Warlord with a certain number of hundred uh, diplomacy points and then that's it um, but in the final game we're going to have a slightly different sort of bidding system aren't we yeah so I think people who have played the demo or have seen our stuff so far would um, be familiar with the more just you get a certain number of diplomacy points and you can command um, control of a given warlord directly yep. um, that's the net result of a more sophisticated system that um, actually um, under the hood at the moment but the um, the main idea with it is uh, you gain influence with a given warlord and you use uh, your diplomacy points which are on the bottom there under the, the gong icon uh, with the crane on it um, you use those on individual warlords to gain influence with them and your relative influence on a given warlord is going to dictate whether or not you can diplomatically capture them uh, either when they're not allied or even when they're under somebody else's control. Mm. Um, and your influence on them decays over time. So you need to um, you need to keep up with the warlords under your command, lest they uh, be snatched away from you by other people who are applying influence and uh, dedicating their um, diplomacy resources towards that same warlord. So you have to, you can keep track and you will be able to see relative amounts of influence of each player on a given warlord. And you yeah. have to make decisions strategically based on that. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting in multiplayer actually. I'm really, um... I really enjoy using the Warlord system in single player. Um, haven't played multiplayer yet, but getting this into players' hands will be quite interesting, I think, and, and seeing the kind of the kind of meta tactics that will emerge um, on top of all the normal stuff that you've got going on in the Stronghold game.
Yeah, I was thinking about it and uh, talking to a lot of people at PAX, for example, when we were showing the game mm. uh, for the um, uh, when we first had the Warlord system, even in as it has been shown so far. Um, I think the exciting thing is a lot of people who are into the turn-based, high-level strategy uh, keyed in on the. Um, uh, just it's kind of cool to have that sort of thing on top of RTS gameplay, right? Because you have this meta game on top with this larger strategy and yeah. you have the map view of it and you're playing diplomacy and all that but there's also an rts going on in the meantime and you have to pay attention to <laughs> both things if you want to be effective and yeah suddenly uh, uh, an ally that you've um uh, you have on your flank you know can be flipped if you're not yeah tabs on them. and it's funny as well because um from my perspective the warlord system makes the game in some ways more accessible because you've got other options for uh, taking resources, for building up your army, for uh, shoring up defensive positions, for launching attacks. So there's there's more options and, and, and you know easier paths to you know getting the things that you need. Um, but yeah, at the same time, it kind of raises the skill ceiling considerably as well. Yeah, there's um in the initial levels, you know, they can kind of be like assistants, especially in single player, yeah. where they're really just you know helpers to you, and they can do the tasks that um, you don't need to focus on on that map for, you know, an ox mm. warlord might supply you with uh, tons of stones. So you don't have to create a stone industry yourself or buy it or whatever. Um, or a dragon warlord can uh, be deployed to launch sieges against particular enemies at just the right moment. So you can uh, bolster your own military forces with a few extras as opposed to having to rely on doing all the attacking yourself. I really like that from a, um, uh, I guess it feels more like you're playing with other people, but they're um, uh, extraordinarily willing to go along with whatever it is you want them to do. Yeah. <laughs> I am liking in this map how um, it's our head of QA um, playing at the moment, but he's basically just kind of like leapfrogging from one wall to the other taking them all by force and just kind of like reserving all his diplomacy not spending any diplomacy points on um, taking them through diplomacy um, but just spending all of that on upgrading the wallers themselves, their armies, etc. Et yeah, so if you don't want to invest the significant resources it can take to steal a warlord away from another uh, proper player um, you can always waltz in with your army and uh, uh, cow the warlord by force but yeah. And There's he bends the knee army. now. He bends the knee, doesn't he? Yeah, uh, is that in the video? I didn't see. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's um, one of the various walls ta overtaken here. You can see, um, you can see them dropping the knee. I think it might have been the ox. You can see the guy um, dropping his knee down and uh, pledging allegiance rather than doing what he was doing before, which was just dying very loud loudly <laughs> and then respawning. <laughs> yeah, the AI lords could learn something from that. You know, they could just bend the knee and they wouldn't have to. Uh, exactly. <laughs> completely wiped out by the players to win. <laughs> we also got yeah, some the, uh, cool formations. Yeah, we're pretty pleased with the, um, the formations work this time around. Um, Especially on a big is, open map like this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, part of that is um, Steven really uh, took the reins on that and decided he wanted to make them just as good as we could get them. So they got a lot of um, attention with um, the way they form up and the way they choose their formations. And uh, we coupled that with um, a degree of troop collision. So um, they don't just walk through each other uh, yep. transparently in most cases anymore. They uh, they do their best to kind of keep distance from each other just constantly. And so that actually changes the motion dynamic quite a bit with um, uh, moving them around. And it makes them feel just kind of more like physical things, mm. um, especially as you know two formations move through each other or um, enemy formations you know block. Uh, player formations and vice versa uh, a little more realistic than now so you have yep. the uh, sense that there's somebody in your way and you can't just kind of uh, yeah. walk through them. And you can actually kind of hold the choke point as well rather than having that classic RTS problem with um, yeah, putting a bunch of troops in a, cho in a choke point and then just having someone like skirt around the side. <laughs> Yeah, and we have a um, we have an interesting uh, blend of game types here. You know, a lot of people are used to um, the open war, uh, total war style thing, where the, uh, the uh, squad is just fixed and you can't divide them, right? Yeah. Versus, you know, we have individual troop control, but when they're grouped, we really wanted them to feel like they were more of this kind of squad based thing. 
So when you group them together and you move them as one, we really wanted uh, that concept of uh, you're moving a cohort and they're doing what you'd expect them to do as a group, and they they fight you know another group the way you would expect. But you can still grab an individual archer and send them to a very special you know particular part of the wall that you want to defend. We we thought all that was really. Uh, uh, trying to make that feel right was tricky and yeah. trying to do things like make it so you have a huge amount of troops you can get them through a choke point very kind of unnaturally quickly because <laughs> it feels better than if we really made them all line up and take their time and go through like uh kind of got stuck right yep we we put a lot of work into making it so that they uh, they still kind of flow through these areas about as quickly as you could hope but they don't go through each other in the same way as they used to and uh look more like a uh, a river of troops yeah I, I still try and do the um the classic stronghold tactic of putting like 500 archers into a tower and i all and whenever i'm playing warlords i always do that and I'm, some end up on the wall and i'm like oh yeah we've got that new system now you can't just do that because <laughs> yeah, i'm pretty sure you could do that in like stronghold 2 as well i think it's been around yeah i can't i can't yeah say for sure how far back it goes but it was definitely in crusader 2 you you know a classic exploit was to yep. cram a tower full of people because we didn't have a uh specific check uh and they um they wouldn't push each other out of their you know position now yep. uh, we have a couple of things we have they actually will displace each other from where they're standing so they can't just yep. be on top of each other and on top of that as you mentioned there's a um uh there's actually fire marshal uh postings at the bottom that say you can only have you know x occupants from <laughs> they go damn <laughs> they, they honor that now yeah right right good. but yeah we, we added some little touches so like the um the doors leading to towers and stuff are working uh so they kind of open up if there's a wall connected on one side and you can see them walk up the tower now instead of just flipping to the top little things like that we really wanted to make uh as a just because it makes using the walls and uh, playing with them feel more fun and yeah realistic and that's the point of our game right it's a castle building uh franchise so we have a uh, a big emphasis on all the fun parts of making and playing around with castles yeah like setting them on fire love it which is yeah, what's happened fire here. Is, um, <laughs> it's based on our old uh fire designs but our uh, um, our graphics have gotten a really good overhaul there i think i'm very happy with what our uh, artists and graphics programmer matt have done yeah it's been really cool we're getting a lot out of an old engine. I think it's uh, I think it's safe to say. Yeah, um, you know, early work on this, I was um, I was mostly just going for the gameplay, and then yep. um, when Matt was able to come over full time and work on the graphics, we saw leaps and bounds of improvements. Yep. And uh, he was able to pull a lot of modern techniques in and and um, basically do them basically just because we they had been invented since you know <laughs> we originally did this stuff. Yeah. Uh, so we can we can actually take a lot of that kind of knowledge and just do it with the older engine and, and upgrade the engine itself. Uh, the engine has seen quite an overhaul since uh, even uh, Crusader Two time uh, in terms of all of its capabilities. Uh, just be because we've learned things from other engines and um, uh, modern developments. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think at this stage, you know, the engine is mostly our own code, really. Yeah, the um, the original core uh, from Vision is um, uh, very limited in terms of what it's doing for us at this point. Mm. We um, we've rewritten, we've certainly touched almost all of the code, and uh, we've rewritten uh, a lot of the uh, uh, I don't know the core stuff, yep. like including graphics pipelines and whatnot to add post processing and the like this time around. So we can see that. Um our lead QA slash producer now has managed to take over pretty much all of the uh, all of the map. Um, so this is kind of what you you would be able to expect from a skirmish game, I guess, as well. If you were to play with one other opponent and just fill the map with as many warlords as possible. Yeah, this is why I don't play them legitimately in multiplayer. <laughs> so what what are It'd the plans like in terms of multiplayer and warlords? You'd be able to kind of like randomize them or place them on the map because that's kind of going to be part of the replayability isn't it yeah i think um so uh, in the lobby uh, you'll traditionally choose um the uh, players you know who goes in a given spot yep. and those will be from full ai and human players in uh, in a multiplayer game or in skirmish it'll just be you and ai um but then those warlord estates um 
we're not exactly sure how they're going to uh, how it's going to work um, from the map editor and all that. Yeah. That, but I think the, the main thing that you'll be able to expect is the warlords will be shown on the map on the mini map when you're setting up the multiplayer game in the lobby, very similarly to estates, uh, with the distinction that you'll be able to see which warlord is in each location, right? Uh, and you'll be able to uh, change them, so you'll be able to switch, you know, a uh, tiger warlord to a dragon warlord, for example, if you want to change the the map up. So uh, similar to how you'd choose map resources and the like, you'll be able to also choose which warlord is in a given position. Yeah. Um, and of course, you can also choose a randomize option if you want to be surprised. But um, it will be possible to author maps with a particular idea of which warlord should be in you know, which spot, the same way we do. Um, so you can decide, okay, well, I want this map to be all about controlling the ox warlord here, right, but right, also yeah. using the tiger behind everybody to attack them. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to how um, warlords are going to sort of play in different game modes. So how they would play out in multiplayer versus the kind of wars you'd expect in an economic campaign versus the sort of main single player campaign and kind of how they kind of affect all those different game modes will be quite cool. And free build as well, of course. Yeah, I think that'll be particularly fun. Um, just you may value a given warlord in a given mode a lot more than in another. Yeah. In free build, you know, unless you're sending uh, sieges against your own castle, um, the tiger might not be so useful. No. <laughs> so it looks like, it looks like we're going to win this this uh, particular engagement. I do love how um, our player here has managed to just completely dominate the opposition because this is a map in which you get attacked in the first. I think it was like first minute. So like, you know, I mean, this is like pretty late on in the in the single player content, right? So you're gonna be you're gonna be pretty good by this stage, but um, yeah, it's it's not gonna mess around. So people that uh, people that are hoping for a, a challenging uh, sort of you know challenging content in terms of the single player are definitely gonna get that. Yeah, I think um, the uh, the curves on single player campaign should be quite good, meaning the difficulty. Um, you know, early on. Um, the whole point of the single player is to it, introduce the concepts of the game, you know, one yep. by one in a fun way, right? And um, actually be enjoyable, uh, either puzzles or just learning how to um, muster armies or control warlords and the like. Yep. And by the end, you should be quite ready for multiplayer, um, except against some of those real monsters out there who are <laughs> extremely good at these things and will wipe the floor with anybody. And we will have... Um difficulty settings in the single player campaign weren't we as well so that people who maybe aren't as hardcore as uh, some of the stronghold players out there can um, still get through the campaign yeah i don't know the specific plans but i do know that we have um in uh, the map editor for example you can specify you know uh, differences based on difficulty and um, usually the ai has some um, basically um <laughs> if it's going to hold back or not yeah based on difficulty yeah yeah, this is uh, the smart money on, on these um, videos is always on QA. Yeah, definitely. So this is quite a good example of, because um, I think in the last video, Matt and I were talking about uh, the differences between the different sort of attacks that wars can send. So they can launch attacks against the enemy for you. They can um, add troops to your army. Uh, so there's various kind of you know different uh, attacks that the warlords can launch on enemy players, whether it's contributing to your army as a relief force or direct directly attacking the enemy and to kind of take away the um, the sort of focus from your forces or in this case soften them up a bit maybe beforehand. Yeah, I think even on the demo, I really enjoyed using the um, dragon warlord um, to just pepper up the castle before yeah. investing my own troops in it. Yeah. And here, uh, Dave is using some very expensive but very effective rocket launchers. <laughs> very, very well. I don't think he misfired even one. I think they're all they've all done massive damage. You're very lucky there, yeah. Well, this is the thing. Like, I think that the the wall system, like, it sounds on the surface like it's quite. It could be quite complicated, and it is obviously true in this case that you can, if you're using it right, you can kind of, you know, completely dominate a match. But um, for me, I just, I just really like the fact that you can open up the screen and you can just. You know, it's very easy to understand. It's very easy to see who can give you what based on their archetype. 
Um, and then it's a really satisfying way of getting those resources or getting those troops or, you know, launching a second attack that's, you know, doing things that in traditionally in a stronghold game are quite difficult to achieve because you have to have the right resources in place, the right buildings, um, you know, all these kind of, all these factors that you don't kind of have in a regular RTS where you need to think of like armor, weapons for your troops, available peasants, you know, all these, all these kind of various different factors at play. Yeah, I think my favorite part is really the uh, the idea of having very pliable allies all the time, right? It's um, yeah. in the past you may have had AI, um, you know, full AI uh, on your team or something in a multiplayer game, and you could kind of tell them where to attack and that sort of thing. But here you really have fine grain yeah. control, and you you even can shop around for allies based on you know their specialty, like you said. Yeah. You know cool. So we're gonna Warlord, you're gonna do so we're gonna wrap up there. Um, thank you very much, Tony, for your help. Uh, going through this today, and um, I'm sure we'll speak to you again soon. Yeah, it was a real pleasure. Thanks for having me.